Compassion Plans, Episode 14, How to Disrupt Compassionately with Evo Terra from Big Bounce. The world we live in is far from perfect. How can I effectively make a difference? This is Compassion Plans, a weekly interview to help you make the world a better place with your host, Bentley Davis. Welcome to Compassion Plans. I'm Bentley Davis, and today I have Evo Terra from Big Bounce, who is the Chief Disruption Officer. Welcome to the show, Evo. Thanks for having me, Bentley. So, Evo, what is a Chief Disruption Officer? Uh, me is, is the very short answer of that. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Disruption Officer is kind of a new title uh, that some businesses large and small are getting into. In my particular world, uh, I picked the title Chief Disruption Officer because it sounded cool. Mm -hmm. And it sounded much better than president or co-founder, which you know, all of those things apply as well. Um, Big Bounce is a company that helps disruptive startups learn how to become real businesses. And my job is to hold the clients we work with accountable on a weekly basis to make sure they're not only being disruptive, but also meeting their business goals and objectives so that they can grow into a real company and you know, take over the world or or a small piece of that. So, yeah, my role is to make sure that disruption is actually happening, it, that it's a good thing, and that the companies are successful. I heard you at Podcast Movement 2014, and you were talking on the topic of disruption. And I thought that'd be extremely valuable to people that are listening to Compassion Plans, because they are usually starting a business, some are for and some are non-profit both of those types. They want to have impact, they want to reach people, and some of them would call themselves disruptive, and you had a really good definition for disruptive, and they may or may not be technically disruptive, but I have a feeling that a lot of what you know would help them be impactful. So could you tell us a little bit about how you define disruption? Certainly. So disruption is something I've been studying uh, for some time, and because I didn't realize it, but I was doing disruptive things all along. I just thought I liked to break stuff. But as it turns out, I like to break stuff and then see how it gets reassembled and put back together to make something better. So disruption, as I have come to, to understand it, is a litmus test, if you will, of, of three things you look at to find out whether or not your product, your idea, your company is actually disruptive or not. And those three things, if I can cover those tenets, are pretty quick and easy to understand. The, the first tenet is that it must be aimed at a stable, extant marketplace. In other words, something that is here and established. Time frame doesn't really matter, but as I like to tell people, you can't worry about disrupting the space elevator market because it doesn't exist. But just about anything is really, really uh, works out for that. But that that's your idea. Make sure it's a stable and existing marketplace that you're going after. Number two, <clears throat> you must have your product or service or whatever it is aimed not at the majority, but at the underserved minority that is currently using the marketplace as it exists today. But don't go after everyone. The idea here is go after just a few, whether that's 10, 100, or 1,000 people that are in the market right now that are not completely satisfied with the offerings. Those are the people that you appeal to, which is a, it's a different model. A lot of companies are thinking, where can I make the biggest bang for my buck? But mm -hmm. the challenge with disruption is that you have to understand whether your product service thing is a really a good idea. And before you try and convince everyone that it works, just try and convince a few that your way of doing things is better. And then that leads to the third tenet of disruption is that it must scale. Because if it doesn't scale, it's just a hot. So if you can actually scale it up either to those people who are using the existing marketplace, uh, which is great, that's that's what we call vertical scale, or horizontally bringing new people into the marketplace that had no idea or had no use for the incumbent way of doing things, but you can bring them along. So if you can do those three things, or if you can see the future of those three things for your product, service, business, whatever, then you're probably being disruptive. And do you think you need to be disruptive to have a valuable business, or is that just the type of things that you enjoy focusing on? Yeah, not, not at all. There are many non-disruptive businesses, what I, what I call hitch businesses, as in just hitch yourself to the wagon or the same thing. Take e-cigarette stores for a, a moment. You know, they're eventually going to disrupt Starbucks because Starbucks won't have any place to put, you know, another three buildings on the same block because they're everywhere. I mean, they're, the world is lousy with, with e-cigarette companies, and they're successful businesses. Are they disruptive? No. 
you know, not opening up another e-cigarette store in the corner is not disrupting a market. You're just at, at, at jump, jumping in on the latest bandwagon. So that's perfectly fine. I don't, I have, I have zero issue with someone trying, trying to make money that way. I'm not an e-cigarette user, but whatever. It's, that's completely your deal. So you don't have to be disruptive in your, in your business or even in your passion, the things you want to do. There's lots of business out there. My interest is on things that are disruptive because I'm <laughs> easily bored. Yeah. And those are very interesting, aren't they? They are. They bring their own unique challenges. Uh, to how do you approach the marketplace? How do you get people interested? How do you talk about what you're, the thing that you're doing? It's just everything's different when you're doing a disruptive business versus a hitch business. That's, that's a mm -hmm. whole lot easier sell sometimes in the hitch market. Uh, but it's a lot more fun, in my opinion, on the disruptive side of the world. Awesome. Um, so for compassion plans, there are two basic types of people. One who just wants to make a positive change in the world. And that could be anything from the local shelter to the local soup kitchen. And then there are the people that literally want to save the world from something, from one, one of the big social issues that are out there. And they have many of the same issues with the businesses that you're helping. And some of them actually are the same type of business and would fit exactly in, in your disruption that you're talking about. But some of them are a little um, kind of teeter-tottering on the fence on whether they're disruptive and definitely are having a problem with scaling. Mm -hmm. So what I thought would be interesting is, is I have three business ideas from three people that have been on compassion plans. And I'd just like to kind of throw these ideas at you and see what you think about. Are they disruptive, even if they're not disruptive? Will, you know, do you, do you think they're kind of scalable? And of course, I'm asking you to do this all without any real prep time. So we're not going to hold you to any predictions or anything. Uh, but I thought it should be fun and interesting. Yeah, no problem. I, I, I do this a lot for people. Uh, when they find out that I'm involved in disruption, they say, hey, is my idea disruptive? So I'll walk, walk you through the same exercise I walk them. Let's do it. All right. So our first example is from a gentleman named Stephen Rubenstein. He was episode number four. He has agreedis.org. He says it's the world's platform for compromised solutions. So he takes very complex solutions like the Middle East peace crisis. He gathers up everyone who really wants to work on this issue uh, on a website, and they enter in all the many options. Like you can have the people stay in Gaza who are in Gaza. You can make a move. You can you can have the Israelis, you know, have their land, give them more land, give them less land. So there's all these bazillion options, and has them all kind of rank and vote and put these together. And he has a way of organizing it, and then he has an algorithm that then calculates based on all that information. It's the compromise where the most people can agree to. Right. The least offensive compromise may be the way to say it. Uh-huh. And so he's had this for about a year. He's spoken in several conferences and stuff like that. So, so the question is, if it were, assuming that it works, um, would that be something that's considered disruptive? Well, let's see. It sounds to me like if I could boil down what he does, he's really crowdsourcing, brainstorm, if you will, for big problems that the world faces. Am I am I getting it right? The differential piece is the algorithm in the background that takes everyone's different solutions for these problems right. and recombines them into the least objectionable solution. Right, so yeah, it's, that's, that's, the, that's one the technology, step above. The, the IP behind all of that, but what he's doing from, from an outward point of view is if you want to be a part of this conversation, you want to contribute your ideas, here mm -hmm. they are, and then through some proprietary algorithms, he comes up and says, these seem to be the most applicable solutions. Yeah. Uh, Right, right. So it's, it's, I, I love the concept of pulling in um, a subsection of, of human knowledge uh, and, and innovation and intuition and, and putting them together to see, to see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so let's, let's back up and be clinical about it. So the very first thing we have to ask is, what industry is being disrupted here? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if I know the answer to that question right now. There are lots of right. think tanks out there. There's lots of solutions that exist that are trying to solve these world problems. Um, so it, this, that may be a little, can you think of something off, off of your no, head? No, uh, that's the, that's the one piece that I think most of these won't yeah. fit when you're doing these things that you may not be going against. The, the thing that you may be going against is the way people think and the way people solve problems, which isn't really a marketplace. Right. But it is a way of thinking. It is a way of thinking. And I think we can probably be a little flexible on my definition about this existent marketplace, because really, what's the marketplace for ideas? I mean, it's, it's not right. really an exchange of, of monetary transactions, but it, it sounds to me like it's probably a very fractured marketplace already. There's probably mm -hmm. lots of different 
people on different organizations that are trying to. In fact, I know these these think tanks exist and these these online communities and these you know uh, hippie communes. All of these people are trying to do that one. So it may be a much more nebulous marketplace that exists out there. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm I'm going to give that one a pass and say, yeah, I think they're probably we could probably sit and figure something out. Um, so the second thing is, is it serving an, an underserved minority? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's a yes. And and the good news is, since there's not a giant, ob- uh, obvious marketplace on that one, that means every player in this space probably is working with an underserved uh, minority. Right. He's kind of turning it around on his head, though, because he wants ultimately everyone to be involved, with, which is good news because it'll apply towards number three here. But mm-hmm. I would imagine he's got a core set of users um, he's not, he probably does not have millions of people using the product right now. Right. So yeah, he's already got an underserved minority of people who aren't getting what they need in other places. That's a fit. And then the third one is, can it scale? And if it is an online site, which, you know, it compiles with algorithms, it mm-hmm. sounds automatically scalable. So yeah. I'm going to say that I believe that is a disruptive business model. Excellent. Would you have any tips or suggestions on helping him gain more traction and more users, assuming that's his goal. Yeah, so his his challenge is going to be, because it's not a well-defined market, uh, because it's a very fractured marketplace, if I'm making those assumptions, mm-hmm. it's one of those things that people don't know that they can they can have an influence on. I don't. Right. There, there are certain people that are out there looking for ways to get involved uh, with this, but there a lot of people are, are just happy to complain on Facebook uh, and, right. not, and not really jump in. So he's going to likely have to rely on his member base. A great marketing technique is to use your existing market base. It's one of the one of the best ones to do it. And give them the promotional tools necessary to bring in their friends and family and other people into the conversation through social shares and other things. Um, start publishing wins. Start, you know, start taking a look at proposed solutions, you know, like take the Gaza Strip issues and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, the that's that's an intractable problem that mm-hmm. governments don't seem to be able to solve for the last several thousand years, uh, and we sure didn't help 60 years ago. Right. But um, I would start talking about here are the solutions we've come up with that are better than what's happening out there in the news. You could probably get a lot of additional traction that way. Awesome. Let's jump to another one, and this is called Rebutter. It is by Shane Greenup been around for, I believe, three years now, and he was on episode seven. So Rebutter tells you when the web page you're viewing has been disputed, rebutted, or contradicted elsewhere on the internet. So those that may not have heard it, you have a plugin that goes into your browser in a couple other ways, uh, and basically it'll pop up when you're reading a website, and it'll show you other web pages that disagree with it or contradict that. He has about 20,000 users currently. And so we see whether we, we feel that that's disruptive. So I'm familiar with the Rebutter software. It's part of the, the skeptic toolbox, if you will. Uh, and I will first off say that I love it. It's a, it's a great tool, and I, and I highly recommend people install on their system, especially those that are highly gullible and will mm-hmm. just forward anything, you know, which is roughly 95% of the Internet. Um, right. <clears throat> So first question is, is it disruptive? Well, again, let's, let's look at it in three ways. You know, what's the marketplace that it's disrupting? Once again, I think we're up against an, an unclear marketplace. However, it's one of those nebulous things that goes over the top of things. We're talking about moving from opinion to fact and a lot of the information that's published out there. And people want news and information. So there's definitely a, a, a news industry that exists out there. And oftentimes in the news media industries uh, haste to get things published before anyone else, which is still a very important thing. They're not always fact-checked. And mm-hmm. so th- things get out there that are that are inappropriate. So there's definitely a, a news marketplace uh, out there. So I think if we just focused on that, this, this information, whether, whether it's news or whether it's ideas about health supplements and other sorts of things, yes, let's say there's an industry around that. I think there's a giant underserved minority, people who want to know the real answer. We're flooded by the Memon Azas of the world who have, you know, the next best miracle cure every single day. And it's not true in <laughs> a lot of these cases. Right. So there's a, there are people out there that are, I think, could be injured uh, by, by these, these false claims um, and this misinformation that's out there. But there are a growing number of people who say, I want to know 
not necessarily the truth because the truth is hard to get to, but I want to know when somebody is BSing me or I want to know when somebody's talking about something for their own personal gain. Yes, maybe a study was conducted that shows this, but how is that study? Who did the study and how are they connected to the group that they had to say nice things about? So there's lots of people out there who want better information um, that exists. So definitely there's an underserved minority. And can it scale? Absolutely. Because it's a simple little browser plugin, we can get to more and more people who need this, this kind of information. But here's the challenge. The people who need it are the people who refuse to have it. Yeah. There's the, there are, well, let's take my grandparents, for example. My grandparents are in their late 80s. I'm, I'm happy that they're still with us. I'm not happy, however, that their TV is on the same channel every day and they just regurgitate the crap that, that comes out with, without any thought of, of, of reality. Uh, luckily, they're not, you know, they're not internet people. They don't even have a, which sucks going to their house. I have no Wi-Fi connection. But regardless <laughs> of it, um, but luckily, they're not getting, they're not being fooled by lots of the other information that's out there. But the people that are vehemently talking about various things which have been completely nonsensical, like anti-vaxxers for a moment, they're not going to install a plugin like this because it's going to damage their worldview. And that is going to be, that is the challenge of, of Rebutter. Those of us who want it, who want to be properly informed and be a, and and who need perhaps help identifying when something smells like BS? A tool like Rebutter can certainly help, but it's naturally going to be limited in its ability to scale based on someone's desire to install it. I guess one thing we could do is what if some websites started using the Rebutter technology? You know, what if you contracted you know with I don't. I, in any, let's say BuzzFeed, oh God, no, they'd hate it. Um, but let's, <laughs> let's pretend they actually used it. You know, mm -hmm. when something gets posted up there, maybe maybe that shows up. Or maybe they do something with Chrome where it's a, it's a native thing that's automatically installed. I mean, there's some there's yeah. some ways to get there, but now I, right. I think we're starting to take personal choice out of it, which which could cause a problem. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah, and, and, uh, and he has some great ideas that uh, he didn't really share with me, so he's got a lot coming up. Although I was just thinking while you're talking, you know, that where are these where are these where people tend to kind of come together is on social media. Right. It'd be nice if his plug-in on Facebook that whenever a post went flying by that had rebuttals, there would be a single button press to post a comment that has a link to the rebutter because there's a, there's a rebutter page that, yeah. <clears throat> so that you could add it in and then it would, it would just make it so easy for us that use it to spread the word. Just like you were talking about the suggestion on, on yeah. Agritas. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a a great opportunity, and I know that Facebook, and we'll use them as a stand-up for social media, yeah. is already trying some modifications of their algorithm to keep people from being fooled by articles from the Onion and other mm -hmm. sorts of satirical magazines. That, <laughs> that if if you can't recognize it, I guess it sounds like fact because it just mm -hmm. reads like the other crap that's out there. So yeah. maybe they'd be interested in doing something uh, along those lines, to, so that when something that is clear of disinformation has been posted. Um, it it can show up and say, hey, this may not be an accurate representation. Here's some here's some other input that the that the original poster would really have no control over. That's that's mm -hmm. interesting, and, and Facebook's moving towards that way where maybe they would think about doing something like that. It would certainly help bolster their reputation, which has been damaged as of late from some of the uh, people's claims of unethical treatment of the way data is algorithmized. So mm, interesting. I like that plan. Well, these are all kind of challenging for you because they don't fit into. Yeah. Some of those boxes, but you've done a really good job. Uh, let me, this last one was done, uh, it was on episode one. This guy named Bentley Davis. So I'm mm -hmm. going to abuse you and get, get some good information out of you on my own business idea and put you on the spot. One of the challenges in this, and, and you talked about how you help businesses express their idea. Yeah. So the express, and, 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 I, and I've been working on two years on how to explain this idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and really, I, I believe that that is the secret sauce of most businesses is the one sentence of what this business is. Let's hear what you got. So my latest one is, it's called settleit.org and it lets you make a statement that is indisputable. You make a statement that is indisputable. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's dig into that just a little mm -hmm. bit. So in the end result is you can add a statement and it will allow you to crowdsource the pros and cons. And in the end, you will end up with a percent confidence. Mm. So then you can say, I am 93% confident that we should step in to prevent global climate change. Mm. And 
it's indisputable uh, because it includes and it's open to view all the all the reasons for and against uh, that statement and all the reasons for and against each of the child statements underneath it, and it can go on infinitely, which people don't have the time to read. So it's really like taking the rebutter pros and cons, putting it through a mathematical algorithm, and then exposing that the reasoning to the user in a hierarchical format so that you can quickly and easily, you know, when you go to when you see that statement, you can click on it and it'll have like just four or five statements and their percent confidence that tells you why it's ninety three percent. And then you can dig into any of those three or four to four more. So you might agree with the first three statements. Uh, yes, global warming is is man-made. Yes, it's there. But the third statement says, can we do anything? And you say, well, I disagree with that one. They say 90%. I think that's more like 20% confident, meaning I think it's actually false. Mm-hmm. Well, you could open up that statement and look at the reasons for it. And then so one or two things would happen. Either you can add a statement that they left off. Oh, here's a fact or a, a here's a reference that they didn't have, and you can add that to the to the overall statement and change the total. Or you learn something. No, oh, I didn't know that there was this study and it and it's been vetted and people tried to dispute it, but all their disputes were counteracted. So, does that make sense? I, I know it, it it totally makes sense, um, and it's an interesting idea. So, I think if you were to layer in something like rebutter. Mm-hmm. The one we just spoke about that, because the, the challenge that I see with it, and, and of course, we, we would go through the exact same thing we just talked about before. Too. It's hard to find this nebulous marketplace. But let's again, let's just simply assume that it exists. So, yes, obviously, an underserved minority. Well, there's one guy named Bentley that wants to use it. And I assume there are others out there. It sounds like an interesting thing I, I would certainly be involved with. So, yes, let's assume that there's people who aren't getting that good stuff. Um and the third part of it, would it scale? Well, sure. Obviously, there's a lot more people will get to it. So let's let's give that one a disruptive nod, and, and then let's tear into some of the intricacies of that. Mm-hmm. I think if you were to partner with something like a rebutter, would help because here's mm-hmm. a challenge that I see: um, you and I can we are on equal footing when it comes to whether or not Brussels sprouts taste good or not. Mm-hmm. You don't have any additional expertise or knowledge that I have. And right. so if you say yes, I say you're a fool. And that would be true because Brussels sprouts are nasty. But regardless <laughs> of that. Right. But when you start getting into other sorts of conversation, the, the, the danger that I see is, well, let's call it the Fox News syndrome, where mm-hmm. let's bring on two experts to talk about climate change, the one that you brought up before. Mm-hmm. And doctor, they both have doctors whatever they need, climate science, uh, mm-hmm. and one guy says yes, one guy says no. That, that's a false dichotomy because what you would really need to do would be to get another 97 doctors on who say, yes, climate change is real, and then the two people, or I think, yeah, 98 to something like that, then the mm-hmm. two guys who said it's not. So you could put them on a teeter-totter, and then they could just shout out their arguments on one side or the other, right? Because that's, that's where the imbalance gets. So mm-hmm. the challenge I would see in that, is how do you make sure that people's opinions aren't given the same weight as people who actually have facts? And something like Rebutter, maybe a plug-in like that could do that. So if I jump in and say, you know, third level down on the climate change problem, I, I really don't think that CO2 uh, is part of the problem. If I make that statement as just some dude, that's not all that helpful. But if suddenly something like Rebutter comes in and says, yeah, guess what? They're an idiot. Um, and it just crosses that question out. I, I wouldn't want to confuse can uh, make, make make the issue more complicated than it would be. So how do you how do you do that? How are you avoiding just people's opinions as opposed to statements of of reality and fact? Well, that's a good question. And I, my first response to that is we do need those statements in the system because if one person thinks it, there's another person that thinks it, and we yep. need to make sure it's there so that we can rebut it. Okay, which is a great thing for rebutter, and that's why mm-hmm. rebutter. Always has both sides. You you need to show and expose these ideas. Right. So any statement that anyone makes does add a weight to the overall thing, and it's that kind of teeter-totter done with math. It's the responsibility of some other person to come underneath it and state why that is. Like, if he just says, I don't think it is, then you can simply put a statement beneath it, a con, that says, this is not substantiated. And then it would negate it out. Now, let's say the guy comes back a week later and says, oh, well, here's a study that does show that CO2 is not part of the issue. Right. And then the other person can come back and underneath that study put a con, say, well, this was a study done by a high school student who spent four hours on it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So 
it's only as accurate, of course, as the information that's in it. But assuming you have two people that are really want to argue the issue, eventually, the the idea is that it, in that syndrome you mentioned, where you have two people arguing on television, you never go deep enough. They only have right. five minutes, right? Yeah, right. And even if you start going deeper and deeper, people get bored after about an hour. Oh, easily. There, if you can even get people to go that far, I would hazard a statement that everyone's an idiot because no one has actually gone through everything. I mean, you could say, yeah. can say that 97% of the scientists say that climate change is real and it's something we need to address. And then there's the 3% that say don't. Although, you know, I could come back and say to that, there was a certain time where you would say 90% of the scientists believe that Piltdown Man was the earliest human in England, until they found out that that was a fake. So, you know, any statement that I say at the beginning, right. in the first hour of our discussion, all of those can be combated, and should be, but no one has the stamina to do this. So I would say that no one actually, in my mind, has actually researched any of the issues enough. Because you would have to actually talk to people who are diametrically opposed to you in order to make sure that you have rebutted every one of their ideas. Um, and, and then when you do that, we can only remember about seven or eight things at a time. So our brain's not smart enough to take hours and hours of debate and discussion or, or comments on websites and calculate them all together and determine whether the, the basis of the facts provided or the opinions, but hopefully even the opinions will be, have an opportunity to be rebutted. Um, but what this allows you to do is that you can disseminate the problem. People can take different subsections of the tree of information and work on them and argue over them. So you can then take the minds of a thousand people and reduce it down to one number that tells us all. And, and no one has to believe the number. If, if you don't believe it, you can go through, figure out whether there's a wrong statement in there and correct it. Yeah. I could talk about it for hours, though. <laughs> well, it's... Hmm, hmm, hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. I, you know, and so I think we'll just sum it up and say this. Mm -hmm. The, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. give you a quick history lesson, which you probably know, but I'll, for the people that are familiar with it, um, there used to be a time when Wikipedia was a worthless area mm -hmm. to get info because of the ability for anyone yeah. to go in and edit pages, which, by the way, still exists today. Anyone can go edit a Wikipedia page, but Wikipedia is amazing. In its resilience, in its self-correcting mm -hmm. issue. So if someone comes along and defames a page, I'm, I am amazed at how quickly that gets corrected mm -hmm. uh, and the person gets slapped down and perhaps banned. I don't know. But, you know, they're, they're, it, it used to be that citing a Wikipedia page meant you were a moron. And nowadays, Wikipedia is one of the better places actually to get information because you have passionate people. That are, that are fence posting, um, and, and, and protecting certain pages. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of pages that are, that are less trafficked, and so they may be subject to some challenges, but the, the big ones are not. Uh, and that's, that's happened over the last, you know, handful of years as more people have come on board and said, mm -hmm. I want to protect the, the right kind of, in, of, of information that's out there. So you'll probably have to go through a period of, oh man, I, I got slammed by 80,000 people who are in this one crazy conspiracy group that are going nuts. And I don't have enough people mm -hmm. who are rational minded jumping in and, and, and benefiting that one. So you'll, you'll run into those sorts of issues. But hopefully if it, if it takes off, you get enough people that can, that can play the passion game and say, I'm going to really make sure that that the right information is done here, not too heavy handed, but, but also with a, with enough of a heavy hand to make it unattractive for continued vandalism of a page. But I, I think it's an interesting idea. I, I did find out that no one is willing to use it as long as someone else can come <laughs> in and make a change. Because unlike Wikipedia, where you might put a wrong statement at the bottom. Yeah. And, you know, so 99% of it is still true. 1% of it's wrong. So it still provides value. After several conversations, I realized that if someone can put a statement in the bottom of it, they can negate the whole thing and reverse it. And if you're linking to that, you're relinking now to the reversal of incorrect information. So anyone who really thought about it said, anyone could come in and put something stupid at the bottom of it, and it'll ruin the whole thing. So I can't really link to that. So I've had to change it from the Wikipedia model to the uh, GitHub. Are you familiar with GitHub? Mm-hmm. 
Oh, sure. Yeah, so in, in this way, it would be you have it and you can link to your graph. And if someone else wants to modify it, they can make a copy of it and then add to it. Oh, I see. Which is not the ideal way for the future, right? The future, it should be Wikipedia. It should be a complete list of, of human facts going up telling us what conclusions we can make. But I, I don't think I can get the traction on it in, unless I do the GitHub model, and there's going to be duplicates and stuff, and then we have to build a way to have people compare, oh, this person said this, this person said this. Where is it different? And then you can quickly look at that right. and say, oh, well, this guy's an idiot. Well, here, here's the deal. I mean, you need to build an MVP, a minimum viable mm-hmm. product. And there is a very good chance um, that your minimum viable product will only slightly resemble the pivot you're going to be forced to make midway through. But you've got to start. And so you pick, even if it's even if it's a, you know, there's a flaw. I always tell the startups that I work with, go ahead and build the mm-hmm. darn thing and put it in the marketplace knowing there's a flaw. That's okay. You know there's a flaw, but maybe that's a flaw that nobody else cares about, or you'll find some other things that come along that ob- point to an obvious solution to that. So, yeah, yeah don't, don't let a flawed product stop you from actually getting started, even if you know there are fundamental issues with it. Just get it out there. Get some people utilizing it. Own up to your inabilities, if you will, to, to make a perfect product mm-hmm. because you're human, right. and, uh, and see where it goes. That's a good point. Do, would you have any, um, would the, it sounds like the tips for getting some traction on that would be very similar to the other ones. Make sure it's shareable. I mean, all yeah. these are in the, in these all three are in the same space. It's all in about helping people come to the right conclusion. Yep. Yep. Your challenge is going to be finding your first group of hardcore users. So, you know, you're, you're 15 to 100 people that are become your, um, uh, I guess, evangelists mm-hmm. for, for lack of a better term to really push this forward to give you the kind of feedback that you need. You, you may be in perpetual beta, and, and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, start getting it to use. You're going to have to be hard and heavy to motivate those users uh, to do something when a, when a new topic is added. You're going to need to talk to them. You'll need automatic notification if a one statement that they contributed to that they feel strongly about, someone's put something in there, they need instant notification of that. So lots of APIs and hooks to, to get that accomplished as well will move you forward as opposed to just waiting for them to, uh, I guess I should go check and see what's happening on that topic. I'm really mm-hmm. now uh, more more up, updated than that. Yeah, and the quick and easy way to share it on social media. Yep, wouldn't be a bad idea either, although I wouldn't worry about that first. Um, I mean, that that's once once I had my first 15 to 100 people that are actually using it, I would, I would, I would, I don't want to keep it secret. You know, mm-hmm. I wouldn't try and wall it off behind a paywall or anything like that. Um, but I, I would be less uh, about, because the minute you start sharing on social media, you let everybody play right. and that will give you your own unique set of challenges. So I would try and self-contain it until your MVP was at least proven out to, to, to basically work and then, and then go from there. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Sometimes we try to scale before we have, yeah, you know, the, the product at a level that we're ready for it. Correct. Yeah. So uh, be a little careful about that. Any tips about finding those, uh, the first users? I mean, for this case, I think uh, I talked to Shane about how he found his, well, he's at 20,000 users now. Yeah. And uh, he he has gone to the the skeptic community because they care about facts and information right. and that. And he's gotten some flack from them because he allows misinformation in the system too. Mm-hmm. And then I asked him, you know, are you afraid that having this small group would could prevent it from growing in the future? And he he said, well, you know, we need <laughs> we need the people, yeah, because some people are diametrically opposed to 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 skeptics, yeah, whether that's right or wrong. So yeah, I think that's great, and I guess that would fit for mine too. Is is really kind of skeptic, you know, finding a community that's passionate about what you're doing. And the invitation is the important thing. You know, early on in your project, you want to be doing the things that don't scale well for you. And one of those things that doesn't scale very well is reaching out to people individually. First, identifying who would be a good person to have here. You know, again, my grandmother is not a good person to be inside of here. But I would start looking at the places where contentious ideas are are heavily debated and find the people who are passionate uh, on one side of the fence or some other side uh, of the fence and get them involved. So go go to Wikipedia. You can actually monitor the pages that are constantly being changed and revised, Mm -hmm. and you can actually see the individual uh, people, or at least there's their their screen names on Mm -hmm. on Wikipedia that are involved with that. Um, Connect with them. Get to know them. You know, share your their frustrations and then mention to them, 
hey, I've got this new project I'm working on. You got a got a few minutes to spend over there. Not a not a bad way to do it. Well, that's an excellent an excellent suggestion. I'm gonna have to suggest that to um, Steve Rubenstein sure. also because sure. <laughs> yeah, I think that would help him get get some more users. That's the hardest thing is finding your first group of core users, and uh, there is no easy way. You can't just start a Facebook group and assume it's going to work or spam someone's email list. I, I'm a giant fan of hand selecting your your first alpha users. Uh, it's hard work. It takes forever because you can't just find someone and send them a blanket note saying, please come join my thing. They delete it. Uh, it, it takes work to develop a relationship with those people. But once you've mm-hmm. done that, you, you'll you find it a lot easier to grab your next set. Do you have any opinions about nonprofit versus profit? I, I think that starting a nonprofit for startups is incredible pain in the butt. I mean, 501c3s are just not, not easy to, to start. Um, mm-hmm. And I am seeing more models that are the hybrid profit, nonprofit, you know, or profit for social good that mm-hmm. seem to be making some inroads, especially when you're talking about, you know, how people actually contribute to them. So, so here's the deal. Uh, a lot of us, thanks to crowdfunding source for sites and, and, and other places like Kiva.org back in the day, Charity mm-hmm. Water, a bunch of other places, they're making it real easy to make really small donations, you know, $10 here and there, a hundred bucks here and there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, for the majority of people, well, I shouldn't say that because it's not like I know everybody, but for a good, a good number of people that are making those contributions, we're not interested. I'm, I'm one. Uh, we're not interested in the tax write off for a $10 donation mm-hmm. or a $100 donation. Corporations care a lot about tax write offs and people who have large sums of, you know, net income every single year want 501c3. Those are, more important to them, but you're getting regular people that are donating right now, and they're and we're less concerned with that. But what that requires a company to be that's going to go down this model of not chasing tax deferred or the tax free or the you know the, mm-hmm. that, that that nonprofit status on that one is you have to have an incredible amount of transparency and build up an incredible amount of trust with people. I mean, how do I know that ten dollars I donate to your fund to you know save the wild horses in Arkansas? I have no idea if they're wild horses in Arkansas or not. Um, I don't know how where your money's being spent. Is one dollar going to that, or are you just some fly by night organization? So you'd think that'd be a big problem, but it tends not to be because these organizations talk a lot, they share a lot, they're 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 on social, they're doing the right things. People are saying positive things about them. So just the social proof that companies are being able to get out in the marketplace right now removes that requirement of well, I'll only donate to you if, if you're truly a charity that's been registered. Um, because I think a lot of people are, are are seeing new opportunities and they don't want to jump through all of that headaches and hassle of, of generating a real 501c3. So they're doing 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 different models and it's working. Uh, yeah, you know, even if you're if even if you want to start a nonprofit, it's going to take you a year sometimes to get that 501c3 status. Um, yeah. I've heard that they've been slowing down recently with budget cuts and stuff. So you shouldn't really be afraid to take donations. You have to be clear. Uh, well, I mean, one thing, if you're using PayPal, do not use the donate button feature. Yeah. Because if you put get enough money in that account, they will check you out and you have to be a 501c3 and they'll, they'll basically not let you have that money. That's true. Now you can, you can put a support button. <laughs> That's right. Just not the donate button. Support tips. It's really all about being upfront and honest, right? So, so patiobooks.com, one of the things I've ran for the last nine years, we're mm-hmm. not registered as a, as a not for profit organization, but mm-hmm. we give 75% of all the donations we receive back to the author that provided the audiobook that we're, that we're giving away. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's awesome. We keep 25% basically cover the cost to, to run the place. Um, and not being 501c3 uh, compliant has not hurt me in that. And I've also, not been hurt by PayPal. Uh, and I've had the, the PayPal account grow to, I, I, I mean, four figures. I mean, sometimes I think, actually, that's not true. Once I got over five, because I had a, had to put an appeal out to people to come help when we needed a new server. And I got like $18,000 in 20 minutes, crazy like that, which is awesome. Paid for hosting for a year. People are, people are wonderful. And I never ran afoul of that because I never, it was never under the assumption, I mean, I, I was clear about everything that I was doing. So if you just simply say, donate to me, that's going to throw a red flag. You know, ours was donate 
and 75% of your money goes to the author. We keep 25. We were upfront about it. And so PayPal never once had an issue with us. Now, Pio Books is, uh, you can listen to the first chapter. All of oh, it. Oh, all of oh, it. So thanks. you can listen to the whole book. Free. And then you have a tip button. Free serialized audiobooks made available in podcast form. So the, we don't have any partial books. Everything is complete. Some of them are novellas. Some of those are entry novellas to a larger story, but that's, that's few and far between. The vast majority of your complete works, you know, 80,000 words or more, narrated by the author. Uh, each episode of the podcast typically is a chapter of a book, although some chapters are split up in two and some are combined. It doesn't really matter. Um, yes, and you get to listen to those books for free. Authors host the books with us for free. We don't charge them anything. We don't charge you anything. And if you really enjoy the book and you wish to donate to that author, leave them a tip and we will, again, 75% goes to the author and we keep a quarter to keep the place running. Yeah, it's what's well, free. Mm -hmm. We we talked about building businesses on free. What's your philosophy on that? I'm a huge fan of free. Uh, I think that, in fact, that's what PodioBooks.com was. It was born out of two things. Uh, one, this new thing called podcasting, which happened in 2004. I had been producing a, a radio show that was focused on interviewing authors for the two years prior to podcasting, and it continued on afterwards. So it was a natural combination of those, those things that made me create PodioBooks.com. But in my time, 10 years as radio show host interviewing authors, um, Authors are taken advantage of a lot. That's because they're naive um, and they don't really understand the rules of business and they're, they're, they're easy pickings because they want to be popular and famous. So when I started PatioBooks.com, the last thing I wanted to do was be one more place trying to nickel and dime an author or 105,000 an author. So mm -hmm. I wanted to make the whole thing free. And so it took a little bit of finagling, but I'm, I'm fairly good at that. And I, and I found a way to actually to make it work. And it works. It doesn't bring me in a pile of money, but then again, it was never designed to bring me in a pile of money. It did lead to my ability to write podcasting for dummies. It did lead to several different speaking engagements, and all of those things brought money over time. So it's it's very possible for you to give something away for free and, and be successful. For my authors, they're giving away these books for free, building up their audience and turning around and in some cases, not a bunch of cases, but in some cases, getting very large publishing contracts. In other cases, they've gone the self-publish route on Amazon and other sites like that, but they've taken the 60,000 people that love the free audio book they've given away and are buying copies of the ebook or print book that they've self-published or telling their friends about the book. Friends say, well, I don't listen to audio books. I'll just go buy the book for $4.99 on Amazon, and the author's putting three bucks in their pocket every time that happens. So there's lots of ways that I have seen free actually used to become a, a real viable business, and I, and I encourage other people to explore that option. Um, the, the path to riches, well, the path to making any money at all, is not as clear when you do free, but the goodwill you can establish amongst people works really, really well sometimes, and uh, it's something that should not be ignored. Yeah, and that's that's really kind of what this what podcasting is for the most part, right? Exactly. Yeah, we great con, hopefully great content free, <laughs> and then hoping that it leads to other opportunities in the future. And it, and it certainly has for many people. You know, there are people who've made businesses because selling picks and shovels is sometimes the better thing to do than mine your own gold. Who are selling services to podcasters who are who are making money on that, even though the podcaster is giving away something for free. There are mm -hmm. plenty of podcasters who give away a free show that suddenly get additional opportunities to do more interesting, fun things, all because they gave something away for free at the at the onset. It's not working for everyone. It certainly does not work for everyone. But if you're the kind of person that likes to experiment with new things and recognizes that there's more to life than you do something and you expect a paycheck every single time it happens, then you may be pleasantly surprised what can happen if you embrace the concept of free. Yeah, that's an, that'll be an interesting option to think about when we're trying to determine how best to fulfill our compassion um, yep. by getting things out there. Yeah, certainly will be. You have a lot of wisdom in this area. Do you provide consulting for these ideas? and? Or helping people out? I, I do on, on a limited basis, and it's something that I've been, um, a lot of people have been asking me 
more and more uh, these days. And so I've got this idea that I'm noodling with that I'm not quite ready to announce. So don't try rushing to a website right now. Okay. But I will say this, and I haven't told anybody else this on a podcast, Bentley, so so you're you're first. Um, awesome. So hurry up and get it out there so that's actually released first, um, <laughs> is that I am going to start, most likely, I am going to start um, a, a very simple service, which is ridiculously inexpensive. <laughs> that's that's mm. my that's my key. I'm a I'm a big wow. fan of how Google made their money. You know, Google mm-hmm. makes seventeen billion dollars a quarter by charging people little Great. tiny sums of money for that for that click on that that AdSense. So mm-hmm. I want to follow the same model. I'm not Google. I'm just me. Um, but it's going to be an, uh, basically where I become a virtual board member or a virtual CDO, chief disruption officer, if you will, for your startup or your entrepreneurship or maybe an, even a larger company. Um, where people can just simply get my opinion on things like this and, you know, help. What I'm really good at doing, if I'm good at anything, is helping people figure out what not to do. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, there's lots of paths, so I can help identify the ones that are ridiculous and you shouldn't actually do. And hopefully it narrows it down to where you can make some better choices. So I'm noodling with ways that I can, that I can do that. So if, if anybody's listening is interested in that and says, wow, Evo, you're the smartest person I've ever met. Or maybe you're just not as dumb as some of the people that I met. Much <laughs> more likely to be the latter. Um, email me, and I'll I'll put you on my list for when it's time to to, to notify the world about my new little venture here. What's your email address? This is Evo at gmail dot com. Awesome. And if they want to find out just more about you or or what's going on, do you have any certain place to send them? EvoTerra.com is the place that I occasionally, uh, well, all of my publications, my books are over there and, and links to things that are currently happening. Um, I'm relatively active on Google Plus and LinkedIn these days, um, and I'm, always, I'm available there. Pretty simple to find me. If you just simply type in EvoTerra in a search engine, I'm pretty sure the first 10 pages is me. So pick <laughs> the one that's most interesting to you. Well, Evo, I really appreciate your time and uh, that you kind of helped us get some ideas on, on how we can grow and and uh, verify our, our ideas to make the world a better play. I appreciate you having me on the program, Bentley. And thank you so much for listening. Get the links and notes for today's show at CompassionPlans.com slash 14. Never miss an episode by entering your email into our subscription list while you're there. If you appreciate what we're doing, go to CompassionPlans.com slash appreciate to find out how you can spread compassion by grading and reviewing this podcast on iTunes. Thank you so much for caring.